I love Christmas time for a lot of reasons, uh, but uh, one is because we sing songs like that and uh, you hear them in public and uh, some of them are great gospel hymns, amen? So, but also we like presents, right? I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> All right, take your Bible, if you would, please turn to First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21. Who already has their tree up? Oh, good, good, good. Who is still planning to put a tree up? Okay, a couple. Okay. Who puts it up Christmas Eve? Nobody? Good. Because I never understood that one. I never understood that one. Who opens their presents on Christmas Eve? One present. Okay. Okay. Okay, good, good, good. So most of you wait till Christmas Day. Christmas Day? Okay. Good, good, good. All right, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it's more of a a thought, and I I don't like talking about the plague a lot unless um, I feel it's appropriate in church, you know, to, I don't want to have to think about it again, you know, we think about it all week. But um, this chapter is about a plague. It's about a plague, but the plague is just part of it. And uh, what we see in in this plague, as I believe are with all plagues, is that God was in it. God was in it. Um, The plague didn't have to be, but it was, and God was in it. Um, I don't think the Lord really wanted it to be there, but it was, and and God allowed it to come, and God was in the plague. And uh, as we thought about some last week and the week before, that God is, no matter how it came and no matter what it is, God is allowing it to be here. And uh, But in this chapter, we will see uh, the Lord. In this chapter, we will see Satan. In this chapter, we see uh, Christians. Uh, in this chapter, we see uh, unsaved people mentioned here in the world. In this chapter, we see God's people sin. In this chapter, we see plagues. In this chapter, we see uh, decisions about um, hard decisions. In this chapter, we see mercy. In this chapter, we see judgment. Uh, And so there's a lot of things in this chapter um, that I believe that we could use, uh, especially today, that could help us. And uh, mainly, in the bottom line, is we see the Lord working. And you get some, a little bit of, uh, I believe this, what the Lord does here is gives us a little bit of the behind the scenes uh, insight on how God's working. Um, As a lost person, they just see what what they see. Uh, But as a Christian, we can see deeper than than what's going on 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 the surface. We know... We know this for sure, that God is working. And so I just want to share uh, some of the thoughts here this morning from this portion of Scripture. Father, we thank you for uh, your goodness to us. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. And we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd help us 
uh, help us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's start off at verse 21, uh, verse 1 of chapter 21, verse 1, and we'll just kind of go through it this way uh, this morning. In verse 1 it says, and Satan stood up against Israel. Uh, the thought there is he sought uh, as much control as he could get over their lives. When he stood up against Israel, his motive, it's, it's, it's always about him, and he was trying to do what he could do to have influence over their lives. God's people. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number the people. And the thought there is he, 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 he was influencing him um, the best that he could. And I think we're all influenced in different ways. We all have, uh, we all have weaknesses uh, to the flesh and to the world. And, and, uh, and so he, he influenced David to, to do something, in this case, was a wrong thing. Um, I'm saying what he did was wrong, but it's not always wrong. But for David, it was wrong. And uh, so, so Satan does this uh, because he has a motive for him to be in control and to to be uh, over as many people and to be involved in their lives. So he goes to the leader, David, and he, he's provoking him to do this thing. You know what? That is kind of that whisper in the ear. That, uh, hey, you ever thought about this? And he knows, what, he knows our weaknesses. He knows what our flesh desires. And, um, and so uh, we would call that what? Temptation. A temptation. And, uh, but there's more to it than this. There's more to it to this. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Samuel chapter 24, it's an account of the same thing, the same story, but it just gives some different detail. And in verse 1 it says, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. See, not only was Satan moving in, and, and uh, Satan uh, was against Israel, and Satan doesn't want God's people to do well, and so Satan goes to David, but God was already upset with the Israelites because of some sin that they were involved in. So, so in this picture, God is um, preparing judgment on his people. And... Um, and so Satan goes to David, the king, by way of pride. By way of pride. Because he's, he wants him to number the people. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, but pride, um, maybe his strength in the kingdom and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against uh, Israel and he moved against David against them to say, go number the children of Judah, Israel and Judah. So Satan's, uh, God is preparing judgment on Israel. And so Satan has an opportunity and Satan's allowed to go to David and tempt him. Do you, do you know uh, that Satan cannot do anything to you without the Lord's permission? Um, and in fact, if you read the book of Job, in that case, and I'm sure uh, there are other times that it was even God's idea. Remember, Satan uh, came before the Lord and, and, and God said, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, I've been walking to and fro in the earth and I'm, I'm looking for somebody. And God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He won't listen to you. And Satan says, I bet he will. And God says, no, he won't. And so, you know, and that's the book of Job. Well, in this case, uh, Satan's allowed to go to David. Uh, but God is, in his sovereignty, um, there's, there's several things that happen here. But one is that God is preparing judgment upon his people. 
So we see that Satan moved David, yet the Lord allows this chastisement um, against David to go somewhere else. Now, think about this. Um, David numbering the people was sin. Now, he'd numbered the people before, and it wasn't a sin. But here it's a sin. The same thing, but it's all about motive and purpose. Isn't that amazing? I mean, one time God tells him to number the people. Another time, it was wrong to do. But it's your purpose, it's your motive, it's your heart and what you're doing. In fact, let me read this one to you in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 12. It says, when thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, in other words, after you're done counting them, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. In other words, God was saying, Let's number them and they can, they can make their offerings to the Lord so a plague doesn't come. Now, he numbers them and long story short, because of that, a plague does come because it was wrong to do here. Why was it wrong to do? A man only has the right to count or number what belongs to him. And as David counted the children of Israel, in this case, he was counting them as his people. He was counting them, he was looking at his strength. He was looking at um, his strength uh, and also what, if you will, what he built. And the thing is, it wasn't his. It wasn't his to count. And if you look at that as your strength, David would have trusted in that instead of the Lord. Because you can tell by what Joab says to David later, um, you know, it doesn't matter how many we have, we have God. But David wasn't looking at that, he was looking at the strength of the people, in other words, his kingdom. And uh, so, again, numbering... Uh, God's people wasn't wrong in itself. It, every, it depended on the motive. And here, uh, it was born of pride. And when it's born of pride, it's a dangerous thing because we will trust in what we have and not depend on right. God. Right. And I was thinking about that. Long story short, this is what brought me to this is I kind of been thinking about, you know, down the road and days ahead and, you know, as we all are. And, and this question came to my mind, what are you counting on to get you through some tough days if tough days are coming? What are you counting on to get you through some tough days if tough days are coming? That's what David was doing. Okay, I got to count my army, got to, you know, got to be ready. And, you know, and there's rumbles over here, and there's rumbles over here, there's stuff going on, I got to be ready. And, um, and so... He, his motive in counting the people was how strong am I to take on the tough days ahead. And here, he was even warned, we'll see this, he was warned, don't do that because we need to trust God. Now, there's nothing wrong. He worked to build his army. He prepared, he trained, he got them ready. But once you've done all you can do, that's all you can do. And... Um, and so David was trusting in what he had and not in the Lord. Look at verse 2, please. Verse 2. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it, that I may um, trust in it i got to know what I have. Now watch this. Um, God says, God can, what, what Joab is saying, God can give you more people if you need more people. Or God can make 
more, God can do more with the people you have. You know, we've read many, many times that, you know, the numbers don't matter. Sometimes God wants you to have less numbers so he can show his glory. God wants you to have less. Because when we're weak, he's strong, and we want to see God in this. So Joab answered, after he got this order from the king, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. God can give us more people if we need more people. And God can do more with the people we have. But my Lord, the king, are they not all the Lord's servant? Why then doth the Lord require this thing? Why are you asking me to do this? Why are you asking me to do something that is wrong? Why will he be a, a cause of trespass to Israel? In number or, or 2 Samuel 24, it says, And Joab said unto the king, Now, the Lord thy God, add unto thy people how many soever they be, a hundredfold, that the eyes of the Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Something that is wrong. He said you're requiring something. Uh, you're actually delighting in it. In other words, you're inclined or pleased. You see this as a path. To pursue, why are you even going there? You ever heard anybody say that? Why are you even going there? And that's what Joab is saying. He said, King, why are we even going there? Why are we even talking about this? This is wrong. Now think about this. Verse 4, please. Verse 4. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Um, verse uh, well let me, let me read you another verse in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and uh, verse uh, 4 it says notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host so it's, so it's Joab and all the leaders that were involved so it was a whole lot of people that could see this was an obvious sin it was something that they should not do but the king, um, the king was persistent in this. Now, let's back up for a minute. What's, what's God doing in, in the background? He's allowing this. He's allowing the leadership, the, even the godly leadership, he's allowing this to happen because God's people had sinned and made God angry. They sinned against the Lord. God's people did. And God was bringing judgment to the people. And, 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 and so Joab would see this and, and the leaders would see this and they say, you know, this is wrong. And it was wrong. But here's the question we can ask a lot of times is how with everything going on and everything so messed up and people obviously doing wrong, how can God be in that? How can the Lord even, it, it, it just seems like the Lord doesn't even know what's going on sometimes because if God was there, wouldn't he stop it? Here's the thing, we don't know, we don't know everything that God's doing. We don't know what God's doing. When God's hand moves among people, when God's hand moves in a smaller situation, sometimes we see a little bit closer. But even at that, we don't know everything that God's doing in hearts. And when God moves in cities and nations and in the world, brother, we have no clue what God has planned. We have no clue what God's doing. You know what the Bible says for us to do during these times is just trust him. I mean, there's some things we do know. We do know that God is God. We do know that God is working. We do know that God doesn't take his hand off the wheel. 
We do know that all things work together for good to them that love God, Amen. to them who are the called according to his purpose. We do know God still loves us and God still uh, has us living his will and his plan. We do know that so we can trust him. Amen? Amen. Because you look at Joab and these elders, they were getting involved in something they didn't even want to do. Now think about this in verse 5, back at, at uh, First Chronicles, verse 5. So Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and hundred thousand men that drew sword. Judah was four uh, hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. He said, some of our, I just, I'm just not doing it. So the total number of fighting men was over a million men. And so the estimations were uh, Israel was somewhere around six million people. It's a lot of people. Could there have been a little bit of David to stand back and say kind of what Nebuchadnezzar said? The Bible says when Nebuchadnezzar was in his house flourishing, he looked out at all that he had and he, and he said, look at this kingdom that I've built and all my people and I'm a really... I'm really pretty good, uh, doing pretty good. I'm a, kind of a big shot. Remember that? God showed him who the big shot was. And I think there might have been a little bit of that even here with David. Because David, this was later in life, and he's won victories and had, you know, I mean, he could, he could whip anybody that God brought in his path. But I think now he's kind of thinking that he had something to do with it. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. And God was what? Displeased. And that's the bottom line. God was displeased with this thing. God was displeased. See, a lot of times we look at what we're doing, and we should, but understand, again, David has done this before. It was okay to do. In fact, the Lord was in it, and God wanted him to do that, and he wanted to do this to uh, help his people. In this case, he did the exact same thing, but it was sin. So be careful about saying, oh, so-and-so does this and so-and-so does that. Um, what's going on here? And what's your motivation? What's your motivation? What, what are you trying to get out of it? Or what are you trying to achieve? And so God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. He smote Israel. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith... It is impossible to please him. So we know that what David did here was 100% in the flesh. And it was his own thing that he was doing. It wasn't God's thing. And God was displeased with that thing, the Bible says. So why, again, why was the numbering wrong? Uh, it was something that he was trusting in, uh, something that he gloried in, and not the Lord. It just wasn't of the Lord. You know, we could get involved in a lot of things that aren't of God. And, um, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, just recently, just things going on. There's a lot of things messing with their head right now. I don't, aren't they? A lot of things messing with my head. Uh, it's just strange things and strange days. You know what I want to do? I want to look to the Lord in this. 
Because when it, it's like a tornado swirling around. And I want to sit down and see God. Where's God? Where's God? That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, what does God want from me during this time? What, what can I do to follow him during this time? In other words, what am I counting on right now to get me through the tough days ahead? The very first thing I need to do is look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. First Chronicles 21, chapter 21, verse 8. And David said unto God, see, he knew. He knew the whole time. And as soon as it was brought up, it just kind of, did you ever, did you ever uh, catch somebody in something and they were just popping with guilt and as soon as you said something, they just kind of spilled the beans? Do you ever have somebody spilled the beans and that's not even what you were talking about? <laughs> so David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away... Uh, the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, go tell, go tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. You ever do that to your kids? Never. I used to like doing that because I like messing with their mind. You get to choose. Number one, I'm going to beat the living tar out of you. (laughs) Number two, I'm taking something away or you can't go somewhere or whatever they want really bad or something like that. Number three, I'm going to beat your sister. (laughs) Right? So God said, I give you three choices. David submits. Now, David says, I'm the sinner. I think David thought these things through. Now, I don't know how long it took. But he reasoned, he reasoned through them. He said, well, um, well, look, look what he says here. God says, here's the choices, and, and look, look what David's reasoning. Verse 12, it says, God says, either three years of famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes. In other words, your enemy come in and attack you. Uh, While that, the sword of thine enemies will overtake thee. In other words, they're going to win for three months. Or else three days, the sword of the Lord. Even, look at there, pestilence, disease, a plague in the land. And the angel of the Lord destroying, destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself. You better think about it. Advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Um, and, and this is tough. It's a hard decision. He said, but here's the obvious choice. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. He said, even in the most severe judgment, I'm going to trust the Lord. He said, let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, But let me not fall into the hand of man. 
What, what are the choices? Three years of famine. Well, if he chose famine, uh, <clears throat> you know, famine would affect some people a whole lot more than other people. Who would it affect? Well, uh, the people with the least money would be affected the most. I mean, they're just living day to day and <clears throat> uh, wealthy people um, maybe could have some reserve and maybe, you know, go somewhere else and get food or another nation. You know, what? in a lot of ways, David would have been excluded from that. They would have made sure the king's fed. So famine, three years of famine. The other one was three months, three months to be defeated by your foes or your enemies come in and they will uh, war against you and your, your guys. And, and um, <clears throat> now you think about that, that's, that's bad. They would have been winning for three months. But that only affects probably, that would probably only affect certain people, mainly the soldiers. And again, David could have been excluded from that, he and his family. And the third one, and you know, and both of them, they would have had to depend on other nations through it all and after it's done even. But the third one was the, was the uh, pestilence or the plague. Three days. But it'll be severe. And he said, the angel of the Lord will come through and destroy and really, they're all bad. But you know, that one would affect who? Everybody. Everybody. Could even touch David's family. David said, you know, it's just better to trust the Lord. I mean, I don't want any of them. But if it's got to happen, then I want to be at God's mercy. If there's mercy to be found, it's going to be with the Lord, not people. So verse 14, the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. So it, it started, it was bad. Verse 15, and God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, now God sent an angel, but what, what was he using? Pestilence. Okay, the angel's sword was pestilence. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, God was watching this, and he repented. The thought there, God changed his mind. He repented of him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough. Stop. Just stop. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, or and Samuel calls him Arona. So the angel just stopped right there. So you think about what David, remember his reasoning in his choice? He could have said, well, <clears throat> I know some kings that owe me. And if we go to war, I'll have them come over and, you know, and with their help. Because he was already looking at how many he had and his soldiers and all that. He could have said, he could have still been on that thinking. I mean, I'll just call my buddies over and anybody comes after us, we'll be ready. He could have said, well, <clears throat> you know, there's some kings that owe me and some kingdoms that we've helped and, and if we go through a pestilence, I can go to them and get some food and we can work this thing out and we've got some stuff in storage and, you know, we can make it. He could have done that. But, you know, he did the wise thing. He said, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. If, if it goes all the way, well, I'll still trust the Lord, but God might do something else. 
God might have mercy on us. And David, in his thinking, was right. Hey, listen, so if we're going to do anything during this time, let's just, if we've learned anything, let's just trust the Lord. Let's not think that things are out of control. Let's understand that he's in total control. And God has a plan, and God is working. God is working. Look at this, verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between earth and heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. So God said, stop. He didn't say put it away. He just said, stop. So the threat was still there. And um, then David and the elders of Israel, remember, they didn't have anything to do with it. And in fact, this whole thing's happening against their advice. If David would have listened to them, they, none of this would even be happening. But they're still with the king, amen? And they... Uh, are in sackcloth, even though they, they didn't even want to do this. But now they are in sackcloth, who, who were clothed in sackcloth and, and fell on their faces and they're begging God and they're praying. And God paused his judgment. But again, the threat was still there. But, so God gave David a chance to get things right and, and to jump in. Verse 17, And David said unto God, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I, uh, it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what, are, uh, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be upon me and on my father's house and not on thy people that they should be plagued. Notice David gets his perspective back now. These are your people. Now David's saying they didn't sin, but actually they did sin with something else that God was bringing judgment. But David took it personally. He said, I'm the one that, that did this sin, and I should be the one being punished, not them. You know, that's a true shepherd's heart. He said, just, just put it on me, not them. And uh, we probably won't have time to go there. God is giving us in the Old Testament that will last forever a type of Christ. And this is what David is doing. He's saying, let me take the sin of the people. And we'll uh, somewhere down the road see that. Look at verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to, to say to David that David should go up and set an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, right where the angel stopped. God said, build an altar right there. That's, a, that's really a, uh, an awesome thing. Uh, and, and here's the thing, the threshing floor, when the angel was coming through, he wasn't quite to the city yet. And um, the threshing floors were normally built in a high place, on a top of a hill or a mountain somewhere, and they would throw the, the weed up, and they were trying to catch every breeze they could catch. And that's where Ornan was. That was the threshing floor of Ornan. Look at verse 19. And David went up uh, at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel. So he, he actually physically saw that angel with the sword and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. Think of this, it was a place of, Ornan was a place of bread. It was a place of provision. It was a place of mercy. It was a place where they met with God. And David came to Ornan and Ornan looked and saw David and went out, out to the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, grant me this place. Grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Now remember, so 70,000 people just died 
Ordan's standing there with his boys. They're working. Here comes King David. And, they, and then Ornan looks up and sees this gigantic angel with a sword. And the, and the king says, I need this place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what choice? I mean, what am I going to do, right? Um, who would have been next? Right? And Ornan said unto David, take it. Take it to thee. Let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. No strings attached. No, I'll give it to you, but no, 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 no. You take the whole thing. I, lo, I give it. I give thee the oxen also for a burnt offering, the threshing floor for instruments of wood, uh, and the wheat for a meal offering. I give it all. I give it all. You know, if we really realize where we are with the Lord, we would do the same thing. How close we came to judgment. How merciful God has been. Um, where would we be without him? He said, I'd give it all. Verse 24, and, and King David said to uh, Ornan, Nay, <clears throat> but I will verily buy it for a full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer a burnt offering without cost. So Ornan said, I'll give you the place. I'll give, you the, I'll give you the ox to sacrifice. You can take all my uh, work instruments and use them for firewood. You can have everything. David said, I can't take it. Because if I did that, it'd be your sacrifice, not mine. Exactly. Amen. I'm the one that sinned. Amen. I need to pay the sacrifice. Amen. You know, um, our, our worship of the Lord, if it doesn't cost us something, it's not going to be worth anything. It's only worth what we're willing to give to it and put into it. But as we see here, God is, God is, um, God is setting up uh, for something that we'll see for, forever. The threshing floor of Ornan. We also call it, um, well, I don't want to tell you. It's, uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you later. Uh, but that's a very significant place. And it's also many types that we can look back on and uh, be helped. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of worship. You know what, ultimately, Christian, uh, this was all going on during a plague. And you say, why are you calling it a plague? The, the Bible calls it a plague even later in the chapter. The angel was destroying, going through the land with the plague. The the plague was his sword. You know, the the best thing God's people could do is go to God. Is there anything I need to do? Is there there anything I'm doing? You know, the Bible says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. If our land needs healing, God's people need to pray. We need to pray humbly, like David did. Like David did. Now, I'm not saying <clears throat> that what you did caused the plague, but uh, I think Brother Miller and I were talking that God's definitely getting our attention. And if he gets our attention, maybe we ought to listen. Maybe he has something he wants to tell us. And, um, hey, listen, but... He's in charge, and he's in control, and we're his people, and we're on his side. It's okay. Amen? Amen. Father, as we come to you this morning, 
Uh, Lord, we thank you for thy word, for this chapter, uh, for the example, example that we have in David, and uh, for what we understand in you, that you are our God and your control. And Lord, we thank you that we see from um, many, many years ago <clears throat> that you're a merciful God. And David's right. You have new mercies every morning. You have, you're full of mercy. And God, as thy people, we come to you. And Lord, we, we ask you to forgive us for trusting and resting in anything else. And Lord, help us today, today to simply trust in you. God, if we need mercy, if there's something that we need to get right with you, help us to do that. And God, we ask for your blessing, your presence today. If there's anybody here today that's never trusted Christ as their Savior, Lord, we pray that you work in their hearts and help them to see their need for you today. With their heads bowed this morning, let me just ask you this, as we're in prayer to the Lord. Is there anyone that would say, Pastor, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I know the Lord, but God spoke to my heart about something today. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up and we'll pray for you? Slip your hand right up. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may put your hands down. Let me ask you this. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Connor, I've never... I've never been saved. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. If I died right now, I'm not 100% sure that I would go to heaven. Would you pray for me? If that's you this morning, you'd like to know about being saved. If I could pray for you, would you slip your hand up so I could do that? Say, Pastor, pray for me because I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Anybody at all? Okay, let's stand, please, with our... Heads bowed, and as the music plays...